So we do have a couple of minutes for questions before we close the session. And we do have two microphones in the room as well, so just raise your hand if you want to comment or reflect or ask a question. Good no questions. Crystal clear. I have a question. Uh, it's difficult to do all this at once. I mean, you don't care about the device. Just do great content, and, and you know everything will be good. Uh, but should we just you know go mobile first and, and not think so much about the more stationary you know devices out there? So uh, yes, I think using mobile as a lens or a catalyst through which to make decisions about how to prioritize and focus and cut things down is, is a great tool. Yeah. However, I don't know, I, I guess it's like I work with a lot of big corporations and they don't have the luxury of thinking about their problems as if they could burn everything to the ground and start from scratch. People have websites that have tens or hundreds of thousands of pages, they have legacy content management technology, they have existing teams of people who are responsible for creating and maintaining that. So it's not like they get you know, a clean slate to start from. So I do think mobile is a really useful tool, but I don't think that we can necessarily just say, like, let's start, let's start there, because the starting point is really still has to take into account everything that we already have. Right. And by neglecting other platforms, by the time you've converted all your content over to mobile and you've neglected those other platforms, next thing you know, we're going to say, okay, now what's our Google Glass strategy? Or yeah. what's our, you know, rabbit ear strategy? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't get that out of my head. That was awesome. <laughs> right. So it needs to be, it, essentially, it needs to be agnostic. It needs to be content first is the other phrase that's thrown around a lot, right? Not mobile first, just me first. focus me first. on the content, you know, agnostically speaking. Yeah. You did throw out a lot of, lot of numbers considering the digital divide. Um, do you think that will change gradually or quickly, or will it stay the same? I think that within the next, I, so, Estimates from McKinsey state that by 2025, there will be between two and three billion new users of the internet worldwide. Um, so it's like within you know, the next decade, we are gonna see the population of the internet triple. And even in the developing world, there, I mean, there's obviously a huge untapped market for people who have, do not have internet access in, in traditional ways. I also think the growth of smartphones and tablets and the decline in PC sales suggests that even people who might have a desktop computer at home now may not choose to replace those. And you know, trust me, it's like I'm not, I'm not saying that the desktop's going anywhere either. That will still be an important component of, of how we go online. But I think as, as Brad made the point really clearly, the only thing that we can plan for isn't, you know, oh, who's going to be using what device? It's just that we have to acknowledge that there's going to be new internet users, and we're not going to know what device they're, they're coming in on. Yeah, especially uh, just this week, all the internet.org stuff, if you saw Mark Zuckerberg spearheading, you know, the campaigns to try to, you know, increase, uh, you know, access to the web, especially to the developing world. I think it's exactly the case. I don't think that we're going to see a slowdown anytime soon, but again, you know, as more and more people get online, there's going to be new technologies emerging and, and we have to solve for that now rather than being a lot, uh, being so reactive to, you know, what we can see right in front of us right this second. Yeah. Last chance, people. Who makes websites in here? Okay. There's I was, a question. Who down makes in the websites? Room. One, Just out two, of curiosity. <laughs> okay. All right. There's a question back there? Yeah, over there in the back. Really? Finally. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Bjorn, and I have a question for Karen. Uh, working a lot with content, obviously. Um, in your opinion, 
what is the most future-friendly CMS or <laughs> CMSs? <laughs> <laughs> I joke about this because I'm laughing because I get this question every single time. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I feel like I should have a button printed up that's like, I can't tell you what CMS to buy. Um, you know, th that it actually is a very good question, and the fact that I get it so often to me suggests that this is a real pain point for a lot of organizations. I, I've also had conversations with people who are like, where I'm like, yeah, you know, your CMS isn't going to support dynamically targeting content to different platforms. And I get this look from people where they're just like, what do you mean? Like, isn't that why we have a CMS? We just spent like 11 bajillion dollars putting a CMS in. And I'm like, well, no. Your CMS was never intended to publish to anything but the web. Like, that's all there was, and so it published to the web. And, you know, it's kind of, you're, it's kind of like you're coming along now and saying, well, you know, why doesn't my car go drive on water? Well, because you didn't ask for it to drive on water. We, we just thought you wanted to drive on the road. So I, I will say that I think in the next two to five years, there's going to be a huge amount of innovation in this space. And what I usually direct people to is to look into what's called decoupled content management. So the tools that provide that today are typically systems that were aimed at like larger enterprise uh, problems that, or companies that had to support print and web publishing from, this, from the same source of content. Those types of platforms are probably overkill for all but the largest enterprise publishers. But I think there's a lot of work that's been done in that space that will make its way to web publishing in the years to come. And I'm seeing interesting things happening with like people essentially hacking together decoupled systems from existing web publishing tools. So like using Drupal as the back end and having that handle all of the content authoring and storage functions, sticking an API in the middle, and then using another system like Typo3 to handle all of the front end pub display and publishing on a particular platform. So it's, I, all I can say is I don't have an answer, but watch this space, because it's going to be a really interesting times for CMS vendors in the next few years. As from, uh, I come from a WordPress background, and uh, I just recently discovered the advanced custom fields option. It's not quite you know, getting to the, the root of the problem, but as far as just making more structured content instead of these big blobs, as Karen said, uh, it's really nice. You could just define what fields you want, and it's really quite nice because you can remove all the extraneous crap and just uh, leave the fields that, that you know, your team needs to populate, which is nice. All right. Thank you, Brad and Karen, for coming in and inspiring us. Hey, thank you.